Good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the Institute of African Studies at Carleton University's Brown Bag Seminar Series at which our um, colleagues and uh, friends test out their ideas and um, we hope that this conversation will be uh, fruitful for us as well as for them as they, uh, they revise their work for publication um, in various fora. Uh, I'm Shireen Hassam, located in the Institute. I am uh, the Canada 150 Research Chair in Gender and African Politics. Um, although we meet uh, virtually um, at the moment, uh, under the circumstances of this never ending pandemic. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that Carleton University is situated uh, on the historic land of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Um, and that as we talk about uh, histories of uh, inclusion and erasure, uh, that we are also mindful of Canada's own uh, histories of erasure of the intellectual uh, and cultural and social contributions of its indigenous people. Uh, in today's uh, seminar, we have uh, Mary Owusu, uh, who is a, a colleague of ours uh, in the history department. She's an instructor in the history department. Uh, Mary did her PhD at the University of Dalhousie. Um, uh, before that, she taught at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. Uh, currently, she lives in Halifax. Um, and in addition to being a historian uh, who has published uh, a couple of books, uh, as well as several articles in the area of intellectual history of Ghana and particularly the gendered nature of that uh, process. Uh, in addition to that, she tells me that she is working on a UN uh, smart cities project um, uh, with UN Habitat, which is based in Ghana. So Mary, welcome. We're going to hand over to you for about 30 minutes uh, to make your presentation, and then I'll open it up for questions from the audience. And um, so it's in your hands. Go ahead. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. So I titled this presentation, Women as Intellectuals. And um, I'm specifically interested in discussing nation building, knowledge making, and the writing of history. And through this, I want to highlight that nation building, knowledge making, writing of history, women are usually excluded, as I hope I can get you to agree with me. So I'm going to be looking at Ghana, but also a funnel approach to Africa. I am looking at the what I call the master narrative, the master narrative or the grand narrative of Ghana. But a lot of what I'm going to say applies to African countries as a general thing. So African nationalist histories is what I'll start with. Then we will go to Ghana. We'll talk about the erasure of women in Ghana's grand narrative. And then we will look for female intellectuals and their contributions via nation building projects. And then hopefully you will have a lot of questions and contributions for me. So I have to say again that this is an ongoing research. I am at the preliminary stages, so I'm excited to get your opinions about how I can make this better or what is good about what I have that I should make sure I keep. Thank you. We'll go on. So when I think of nationalism, in Africa, and here I'm talking about historians, scholars who have written about national, so nationalist historiography, and also textbooks, textbooks that are used in 
schools, so secondary schools, primary schools in Ghana and Africa. Um, for example, uh, the, the, there's the textbook during the Mugabe era in Zimbabwe where the story was about Mugabe came, he saw and he conquered. Ghana has a similar narrative about our first president, Kwame Nkrumah, he came, he saw and he conquered. And in many of these narratives, there is that fixation. He came, he, he saw, he conquered what? The what is anti-colonialism. And it is then a binary of African versus Western. So the Africans in the story are known for their nationalism, their indigeneity, their anti-colonialism, and they are being African and championing Africa. The Europeans in the story, are the Western or the Europeans, the, the Western people in the story, they are the imperialists mostly. They are Europeans, they are known for colonialism and they're known for empire. So this, this would be the textbook accounts versus the and the scholarly accounts. Again, in these narratives, there is a hierarchy. Most of the textbooks starts from proto-nationalism. So there are these people in the African narrative, in the narrative about African national, the nationalists. Some are proto-nationalists. Then they move up the ladder to the emergence of cultural nationalists. Then after the cultural nationalists, you have the conservative nationalists. And finally, at the top is the radical nationalists. Now, what this hierarchy does is to give an account that privileges radical nationalism and radical nationalists, so-called radical nationalism and their nationalists. And this is something that came about because radical nationalists wrote, they, they, they wrote, and after they wrote, particularly in the Ghana story, if you have had an opportunity to read Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah's autobiography, the autobiography is called, is titled Ghana. And in this narrative, Nkrumah gives us this story of how there were people who came before me, the conservatives and the cultural nationalists, but they were not radical enough. They couldn't do the job. And then finally, I came with my group and we conquered. So this span is the proto-nationalists would be those of the 19th century. Cultural nationalists are also of the 19th century. Conservative nationalists come in in the 20th century. So you have, well, cultural nationalists leap. So they move from the 1890s through to the 1930s. Then the conservatives are 1930s till the Second World War. And then the radical nationalists take over from 1945 in most of these accounts. So I'm going to show you a video. It is two minutes. I hope you can, you can hear everything. Now, it is because we are doing Ghana and the Ghanaian story is actually a, a great story because Ghana was the first country south of the Sahara, sub-Saharan Africa to gain her independence. And the, what Ghana did inspired other people in Africa to also form their nation states. And the Ghana style was adopted, twist, adapt, adopted, adapted, changed a little, but still became the dominant style. So this is Ghana. And here is a popular account. What you find in uh, every, every year, 6th March, 1957, uh, when we celebrate 6th March in Ghana. And then what you, you hear, you find in most of the textbooks and scholarly writings. Until 1946, our rule was authoritarian by traditional chiefs everywhere except in the coastal areas like Accra, 
where a small educated elite of African traders and professional men did have a long apprenticeship in self-government. The African upper crust, living in houses like these, expected to take over the Englishman's privileges when he left. And Krumer's supporters were the masses of underemployed primary school leavers. His positive action was a social revolution as well as a nationalist movement. In Krumer united these coastal rebels with the discontented commoners of the Ashanti kingdom. This old gentleman in the bowler is the Santahini of Ashanti, which used to be a strong feudal confederacy in the middle section of Ghana. Back from a visit to Britain for the sake of his health. According to one deputy minister, the Asandahini's political health also benefited because he came back no longer believing in the divine right of kings and prepared to mix freely with his people. In Ashanti and in the upper region, all government used to be conducted in the name of the chief and they were extravagantly praised. During the transition to independence, the Asandahini and other chiefs financed opposition groups which tried to break Ghana up into a loose federation on a tribal basis. Depriving chiefs of political power, Nkrumah assumed the traditional title of Sajifo or super chief of the nation so as to bridge the change. Ghana exalted the leader not only as political head, but as her equivalent of a royal family. Nkrumah does no wrong. Nkrumah does no wrong. A new patriotism was instilled into the young. Nkrumah does no wrong. Thank you for your attention. So we will move on. A little bit about Ghana. Ghana became a British colony officially in 1874. And the territories that made up this British colony were the Gold Coast colony that's on the coast, which was incorporated in 1874. Ashanti was incorporated 1901. The Northern Territories in 1901. Then Transvolta Togoland was given as a trust territory, United Nations trust territory after the First World War to Britain. Then in 1946, all of the territories decided to amalgamate. And so it was in 1946 that they were administered as one. Then in 51, 1951, they had representative government. And in 1957, they got their independence. That is Ghana. So he, these are the people whom we can best describe as the founding fathers of Ghana. From bottom to the top, because of the hierarchy, you have when international figures are allowed, so those who are not necessarily Ghanaian, you have in the account, J.B. Horton on the bottom left, and Edward Wilmot Blyden on the bottom right. They are considered as the inspiring figures for both the conservatives and the radicals in the story. In the middle, we have on the left, John Mensa Saba, J.M. Saba, whose work in 1910 gave the blueprint for the British to begin to think about chiefs, chieftaincy, as a force for colonial administration to, to administer the, the colony. So indirect rule emerges after J.M. Saba writes a book showing how it can be used. Then on the right of J.M. Saba is J.E. Kisley Hayford, another stalwart of the group that is considered the cultural nationalists. These in the middle, are seen in most accounts, textbook scholarly, as the cultural nationalist. On the right, top right, is J.B. Dankwa. He is the figure noted when people think of the conservative nationalist. 
in Guinean history. And on the top left is the iconic figure Kwame Nkrumah, whose name dominates the account and who is seen as the radical nationalist and whose nationalism is mostly considered the be it all of nationalism in these accounts, textbook accounts and scholarly accounts. Now, as you can see, they are all men. So here's where I come in that this master narrative that privileges the men in the story. And, and, and before I forget, all the people I have showed you and, and a little bit more, Atwa Humai, for example, I did not bring in, are all seen as they are all writer intellectuals. So again, when you do the intellectual history of Ghana, these are the people you learn about as intellectuals. And they are seen as also the founding fathers. So what is a nation and what is in a nation is a question I, I have asked myself. And what if we think outside of anti-colonial nationalism and think of nation building? So in such an account, the lady in the middle of, of your screen, Theodosia Okun, she designed the Ghana flag until 2007, nobody knew about her, but she was alive. In fact, she died in 2015. So no textbook had ever mentioned Theodos Yoko. But when you think of a nation, rallying call for a nation, many nations cannot identify who designed their flag. But in Ghana, we could. And it was a woman, Theodos Yoko. I'll say a little bit about her. Theodos Yoko now enters many accounts as the person who designed the national flag. But she's more than that. If you look to the left and right of Theodos Yoko, you see corn silk, corn. So the corn silk, as an artist, which she was, she was an artist. Her artistry, her, her work was steeped in her use of corn silk in all her artworks. In fact, I had the good fortune of meeting Tudus Yoko in 2011, 2012. And I, I unfortunately, before this presentation, I could not go to her home and see if I could find the pictures of her artwork. But she showed me things she had done from the 1960s, exhibitions she had attended, and for which her skill of using corn silk to create her artwork won her many awards. But this unique scale of hers, she did not use watercolor or anything, just these, this corn silk, shiny gold, all her artwork that I saw. That, that's how it was. For someone like Theodos Yoko, it wasn't because someone was good enough to bring her into the story. In fact, Theodos Yoko had to hear about the erasure of herself from a national monument before she went on air radio in Ghana and complained that she had been excluded. So Tedo Sokun was also a sportswoman and known for her hockey playing, hockey tournament, and also as a patron of hockey games in Ghana on the international front too. And she had been the person who built a hockey stadium for Ghana. And in 2007, she had been recognized for it. So her name was there. And in two, she found out that in 2013, there were plans to remove her name from this monument because people thought, who is Theodos Yoko? And why should she be commemorated on a, on a building of such national importance? 
And she came out because she was not dead to say that I am alive, I have contributed, do not erase me. There are others who have not had the opportunity to talk about themselves. So thinking through intellectualism, the men in the story are recognized because they wrote great books. The women I'll be talking about, I argue, are not recognized because they are not considered to have written great books. But women in Ghana uh, have entered some nationalist accounts. Usually they are seen as the, the people who trade, that female, they are traders, they are market women. And they've done, they've done a lot because they traded. They're seen as foot soldiers of political parties. But in many accounts, these women are presented as people who were barely schooled. Whereas men get the privilege of being seen as highly educated and even intellectual. So these are the questions I, I asked that, what if in Ghana's grand narrative, for example, we begin to reflect on women as intellectuals? What, how then can gender disrupt such master narratives? And I thought through this and came up with eight women. There are many, but I ended with eight women who have been excluded, whom I want to argue are nationalists in their own right. And they range in life from, from born in 1905 to um, Mabel Dove, born in 1905, Evelyn Amate Fiu, 1916, Annie Jayage, 1916, Susan Ofuriata, 1917, Theodosi Oko, whom we mentioned earlier, Leticia Obeng, who is a sister to Theodosia Oko, Ekuya Sabie Isi, born 1927, and Felicia Aban. So why do I think these women should be considered intellectuals? Oh. So we'll start with Mabel Dove and Ekuya Sabie Isi. If, if you remember, in the Ghanaian account at the top, we had the icon of conservative nationalism, J.B. Dankwa and the icon of radical nationalism, Kwame Nkrumah. In fact, in political parties that exist today in Ghana, they style themselves as either pro Nkrumah or pro Dankwa. So these two men are powerful figures in the Ghanaian nationalist account. Now Mabel Dav married Dankwa. That's not why she should be included, of course. Mary Dankwa, divorced Dankwa, and became a prominent member of Kwame Nkrumah's CPP. That in itself is intriguing about her. But Mabel Dav was a writer. Dankwa was the first person to introduce a daily newspaper in Ghana, and Mabel Dav wrote for that newspaper. She wrote under many pseudonyms. And in that paper, Dav's, uh, it, that paper was lasted for a little bit. And Dav's contributions were in the way of, it was, it was, was not feminist like we think of feminism today, but it centered the woman. And in, her, in later life, when she joined Kwame Nkrumah's CPP, she wrote many political pieces. She also became the second woman to be an editor in Ghana. And Mabel Duff's pieces in the Kwame Nkrumah newspaper, The Evening News, are her most political writings. Here she takes on, on the continent wide, the struggle for independence all over the continent, and then the anti-colonial struggle in Africa and beyond. Equia Sabia Yisi to the right of Mabel Dav. 
also a writer. AEC was arrested in, at the age of 19 by the colonial administration for being a rabble rouser, quote unquote. Now, at some point, the colonial administration arrested Kwame Nkrumah and CPP stalwarts. And Equia Sabia EC was the person who had to mount the stage. They had, they had an event at the Polo Grounds in Accra and Equia Sabia EC delivered the speech and she roused the, the crowd to an extent that the colonial administration thought a 19 year old was dangerous and she was arrested. After her arrest, her parents sent her to the UK to go and study. Now, I, I forgot to say that Mabel Dav also studied in the UK. And in fact, that's where she met JB Dankwa. So Mabel Dav, um, Akira Sabia, you see, studied in the UK, became a lawyer, and also ended up becoming a judge at the, at the lower courts. And all of them, as I said, both of them writers. The next one are the artistic ones. Kyodos Yokun, we spoke about Felicia Aban. Kwame Nkrumah is an iconic Guinean figure and also very important to Pan-Africanism. Felicia Aban was the only official photographer of Kwame Nkrumah. But that in itself is not the only reason why we should celebrate Felicia Aban. Felicia Aban's work is significant because of her self-portraits. What we see here is a self-portrait. She has so many self-portraits that she, she, she took, aside being the official photographer for Kwame Nkrumah, she took many self-portraits for which in, in different and interesting angles, for which students of photography, some have been lucky to, to study. And then not, 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 not to forget the many female photographers she has trained. These artists, Theodosia's flag, Theodosia Kuhn's flag, Felicia Avans iconic images. These are things that push people to act. It strengthens the will of nations. It creates a significant cultural and political contribution. And then these, they may not be like politicians, but they also, by their work, have created revolutionary and visionary ideas that have moved everybody to action. Today in Ghana, a uniting figure, a uniting thing for us is Theodosia Oko's concept of the Ghana flag and her explanation that the red identify, the red in the Ghana flag stands for the blood of our ancestors. The yellow, or gold stands for our natural resources. Ghana's gold, it used to be called the Gold Coast. And the green stands for Ghana's vegetation. After independence, other African countries adopted Oko's ideas about representing the blood, the natural resources, and the vegetation in their colors. And it is for this reason that I argue that the artistic ones should not be left out when we think through intellectual contributions. Then the science researchers. So Susan DeGraff Johnson, born of Uriata, Susan of Uriata was the first Ghanaian to become a medical doctor in 1947. She was also the third West African after Savage and only the two Nigerians. Oforiata's claim to fame is not only because she was the first medical doctor. She was also the person who founded Ghana's pediatric unit. But her research her research. Today in medical history books, Ghanaians have gifted a word to the world. In medical history books, there is an entry for Kwashioko, Kwashioko. 
malnutrition is a disease of malnutrition. The world over, malnutrition, the, the proper medical term for that is kwashioko. It is the research of Susan DeGraff Johnson and a Jamaican, Cicely Johnson, Cicely Williams, sorry, that helped to bring this condition to our view, but not just bringing it to our view, they also researched it and made it and made significant medical contributions because sometimes uh, before their, their research, some women were branded as having harmed their children, giving them burn marks and all. But it is the research into malnutrition that, that helped to unravel some of the ways in which malnourished children would end up looking, not because they had been physically harmed. So the interesting thing here is that all over the internet, only Cicely Williams is recognized. But if you go into the Ghana Medical Association, the Federation of Ghana Medical Women, Susan DeGraff Johnson is mentioned, or Susan Ophoriata is mentioned as the person who did the research. One of the intriguing stories for me would, when I finish with this research would be, so who did what? <laughs> and why is Williams given the recognition, but not Johnson or Ophoriata? Then Leticia Obin, as I mentioned, Leticia Obin is a sister to Okun, who designed the Ghana flag. She was a scientist, also the first woman to get a PhD in zoology. That was what she did. With her research, Obin contributed to primary work on environmental degradation in Ghana. When Ghana decided to power up her skies and use electricity, Ghana decided to dam one of our rivers, the Volta River. So the dam that was created on the Volta River, the Volta, the Akosumbo Dam, displaced people. And not just that, it brought out diseases like river blindness, bilharzia, and it also disrupted aquatic life. When the people, the villages, were complaining, it was Leticia Obin's primary research that showed one, the why, gave the how, and the what. That saved the Akosumbo project. Today, Ghana's electricity is still mainly from the Akosumbo Dam. And the people whose livelihoods were disrupted because of this Akosumbo Dam or Leticia Obin's research, a lot of how they were able to go through their experiences. Obin was, was a scholar. So she was, in, um, she was at the University of Ghana the Center for Scientific and Industrial Research. She, in fact, Obin was the first person to be hired for this unit. And so her research, her research work, her contributions in, in this area helped. And then when they decided to found the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, she was one of the first female to, to be on it, first female president of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. So, Aside these others, there is also the welfare activists or what can be properly termed women in development. Unfortunately, Evelyn Amate, she was, I couldn't get a, one picture of her. So she's the one in the black by Kwame Nkrumah's wife, Fatia. The, the two women sitting down there in, in the picture, the group picture that you see. 
So Evelyn Amate, if you, founded in 1953, the National Federation of Gold Coast Women, she had also traveled outside to go and study in the, in the UK. She traveled from the UK to the US to go and study the Jamaican Federation of, the Jamaican Federation of Women so that she could use their ways of doing in her National Federation of Gold Coast Women, which she founded in 53. Together with the woman on the left, Aniji Age, they also founded the YWCA Ghana chapter, Young Women's Christian Association, Gold Coast later Ghana chapter. Now, Evelyn Amataifio is also significant here because as a woman who founded the Federation of Gold Coast Women and the YWCA, she came to the attention of the Convention People's Party, CPP, Ghana's party that took Ghana to independence, and its leader, Kwame Nkrumah. And Kwame Nkrumah and the CPP, we, we would say for now, harassed Amata Ifu to the point that in 1661, in 1960, she had to dissolve her National Federation of Gold Coast Women, or Ghana Women. And also, she now had to incorporate, she was asked to become part of the Convention People's Party, the CPP's uh, women's movement, because Nkrumah wanted to homogenize all women's associations and women's activities. And um, she, she tried to fight it, but she was not successful. She was not successful. Then there's Aniji Age. Aniji Age, as you can see down there, there is a street named after Anijage, not in Ghana, but in Switzerland. Anijage was also the first woman to actually become a judge in the Commonwealth. So until Anijage became a judge, no woman in the Commonwealth had been a judge before. Anijage is the principal person to draft the CIDAO, DIDAO, sorry, DIDAO, D-E-D-A-W, so the Declaration on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. This was done in 1967 and is the precursor to the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And it is for this reason that in Switzerland, Anijiage is recognized. Aside this, Anijiage founded the National Council for Women and Development in Ghana. So Anijiage as a judge, Anijiage as a welfare activist, in fact, all her work outside the court was for the welfare of women. What she did, what Amate Fio did, you, 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 you cannot think through them in terms of feminism, the way feminism is, is talked about in structure today. But these two created a form of internationalism that merged Ghana's nation building strategies with women's efforts elsewhere. Yet they are they remain unknown. Then, so what do I want us to, to think, to, to go with? So I'm thinking that if we wrote about the nation and wanted to recognize individuals in the nation and talk to pioneer work, we would find these women, they were pioneers in, in whatever they did. Call to action. They roused people to action. Cerebral projects, they embarked on these, many of them. And then finally, when we think of nation building as the project, not anti-colonial nationalism, not the hierarchy of nationalism, then we will find space to talk about these pioneer women whose activities, were just around the same time as the men, 
but who remain largely excluded in Ghana's national narratives. So thank you very much. And I'm ready for your questions and feedback and contributions. Thank you so much, uh, Mary. That was totally um, fascinating. And, you know, it, it's uh, something I think about often that in a, in a number of feminist texts, we assume that uh, we no longer have to say women were there. But I think it's very familiar to us in Africa that there has not yet, uh, we have not yet excavated these stories of how women were there, where they were, what they did. Uh, and so your project is really interesting from that perspective. For questions, if you could just raise your hand. Um, that would be great. And perhaps while we are waiting uh, for questions, Mary, I'm, I'm interested that you didn't put uh, any political women uh, into the story because, you know, as you mentioned, Ghana has women's associations and uh, I wondered what their relationship was to the story you're telling here. So one of the reasons I left out the politics of it was also because a lot of these women, I, okay, so I wanted to talk about intellectualism and say women were intellectuals too. So if I had gone through to the politics, then that agenda of women as intellectuals would, would, would have been derailed. So that's, that's the, the really straight up answer. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a political scientist. So I tend to think of women in, in politics as also crafting intellectual ideas, but, you know, we can have that debate. Yes, uh, that's great. Uh, yeah, perhaps they're uh, equally unknown, however, <clears throat> in the Ghanaian case. Um, any, any questions from colleagues? Monique, do you want to go ahead and ask? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, very nice uh, story. So um, I've got loads of questions, but I'll ask the one that... So a lot of these names, sometimes you mention it anyway, but a lot of these names are recognizable, like big Ghana nationalist families, right? Or lawyers' families. or. And so I was thinking as you research these women. So there they are forgotten, but parts of families that are prominent. So what does it tell us about what happened at home? Uh, were, they, were they in conflict with people at home? Were they working with their family members who were visible? Were they supporting them invisibly? What, what, how do you see the domestic face of what the story you're telling us? So, uh, Susan Oforiata would fit this very well. The Oforiata family, very prominent Ghanaian political family. And then the husband she married, the Grab Johnson, his family also very prominent political family. And yet um, she was act kept out of many of the accounts. In fact, recently I, I had opportunity to to go to where she comes from the Oforiata family and we were having discussions and her name didn't come up with the Oforiatas themselves as a prominent we were thinking to prominent people in their village nobody mentioned her name and then then that's 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 the part right that people think through it as anti-colonial nationalism and because you cannot capture what she did, I think partly because you cannot capture what she did under anti-colonial nationalism, then what did she do for the building, for the making of the nation story, mm -hmm. is what many people ask. It's the same with um, Oku. Candace. 
Hi, Mary. I enjoyed your talk so much. I apologize. I don't have much of a throat voice right now, so please bear with me. Um, one thing I really struck me is how common the story is that women are written out of uh, the emancipatory or the revolutionary narratives. I think, you know, except for sort of your Rosa Luxembourgs and things like that, these sort of women intellectuals who are every now and then held up almost as though to say, see, we are radical and revolutionary. Look, we have, we valorized this woman, but the women as foot soldiers, even as elite foot soldiers, it's definitely the case in Angola that I look at, and it's it's the case in a lot of places. So you're definitely on to something. But I wanted to ask you a question about the distinction between anti-colonial nationalism and nation building, because I find myself I think I'm actually stuck in that intersection myself, but maybe never really thought to articulate it that way. And so what do you think the distinctions are and why do you think that maybe one narrative has triumphed? And I guess the follow-up, would you consider that sort of an intellectual academic narrative? Something that we as scholars, we've decided to sort of research certain things and certain people and call that anti-colonial nationalism, perhaps because nationalisms of all sorts are sort of, you know, not really, they're not, they're not top of mind anymore in intellectual currents. A question too, you know, when, whether there's a temporal shift yeah. or, you know, when does nation building begin? Um, and yeah, just to add to this, you know, last year we had in the Knowing Africa series, uh, Jacqueline Batois Mugwe, who has written this fabulous book about the presence of women in Cameroon's nation building projects, um, which you might find interesting. And she makes some similar points to you in relation to these, these distinctions, but kind of was, was, was teasing out the social components of nation building and the centrality of women uh, in those processes, even though in some cases, they were quite conservative, of course. I, I, I tend to believe that it's this fascination <laughs> with anti-colonialism that then takes us away from the nation making process. Because if you think through the nation making process outside of Europeans did this and Western people did that, that in itself is a story on its own. Outside of, I mean, it's there, the, the Western powers are there, but if you, if you took your eye off them and focused on the Africans alone, that tells a, 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 story, a unique story. In, it. in fact, sometimes very, very different on this. So this was not the, one of the things I was going to do, but even when you take the people embedded in the story. Again, the hierarchy is because we are grading their nationalism as per the anti-colonial movement. How did they behave against the Western powers? Oh, they were accommodating. Then they are not nationalist enough. Mm. And so those are, that, that's, that's the thing is that, that fascination for me with anti-colonialism, anti-Western, that nationalism has to be that. Thanks, Mary. Tag? I am always careful when we are using the term nation building. Uh, Ghana is a state, but Ghana is not a nation. Neither is Nigeria, neither is South Sudan, neither is Ethiopia. Uh, so these countries, this is not Japan, this is not Bangladesh, where you have 88% of Bengal. This is not Greece. So that in itself is a challenge. So, and especially in a place like Ghana with all the changes that took place. Do you find that this is an impediment for, uh, for, for intellectual women to have a a prominent role, the fact that the, the setting uh, is more tribal, is more localities, is more ethnicities. Uh, certainly there is no there is no one nation. This is a very big problem in a, in a place like Nigeria, where there is a north-south divide and a south-south divide. What, what is your take on that, the fact that 
Ghana is not really a nation in the technical term. Was that an impediment for women to play a role? Thank you. Yeah, or did they also play a role in creating the sense of something larger called an yeah. agent, yeah? And what yeah. did that, and how, and how did they do that? Yeah. Okay. Another good question. So the nation building project versus statism. I think I will leave that for another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> You have to pay me to let you go. <laughs> because, um, the, the fascinating thing with Ghanaian history for me is that, and, and, and particularly when you look at Southern Ghana, is that at every point, there has never been an agenda that excluded women. For, for the most part, like uh, something you can you can you can put put your hand on. I'm not at every point, sorry, in the early days, <laughs> in the 19th, then when you think of the 19th century folks and the early 20th century folks. And I think that uh, this, because these women I spoke about, Susan Oforiata's father was a chief. One would have thought such a conservative person would not educate their daughter to be a medical doctor. Same with Leticia Bain. And so at least for Southern Ghana, we can say that when people were thinking about educating their children, particularly with the prominent families, because I want to be careful here, there was, there was actually a push to move the women. The ARP is the Aborigines Rights Protection Society founded in 1897. All the, the chiefs, whenever they met with the British, always talked about women's female education. We want more schools for our girls. We want them to do this. And then they, they, they would push the girls if they wanted to. But in contrast, the colonial education system <laughs> was structured to, to keep the women as wives and, and mothers. So that's another story. For example, when Susan Oforiata returned, she was impressed upon to start a pediatrics unit because she's a woman. She has to be womanly, motherly, care about the children. There is the story of five women who graduate, graduated from Achimota and they all went to the United Kingdom to study. Two of them studied what we now call pharmacy. So they used to call it drug something, something, I've forgotten, but it's now what we think of as pharmacy. When they returned, the colonial administration asked them to become nurses. That was womanly. And then one person was approached to become the person who dealt with nutrition, nutritional issues, be a nurse and be the nurse who takes care of nutritional issues. And so, the, the systemic keeping of women as homemakers in the, the niche, the, I mean, the colonial plus going down was problematic for the recognition of these women. And, and then I think too, when I read the works of um, Leticia Obing, in fact, she had an opportunity to speak on a topic, African women and development. And, and it's, it's very interesting what she says there, which today, if you're reading with very modern eyes, you say, why are you saying this? Why are you saying that? Because again, if you want to see things from our perspective, present, presentism will make us you know, judge what she, she declares in that paper wrongly. But I asked, because I spoke to her, to Dosioko, I asked her, how come you were never recognized for your artistic contribution, for rallying the nation? Like, if we think of nation, and we are thinking of it as a state, and if you think of the state, the flag helps it to move us towards nation. And she told me that at that time, 
I did not think about being recognized for what I did. I, her husband was actually working as the head of civil service. So she was not even a woman who was, say, quote unquote, in the village, you know, poor, pregnant, and barefoot somewhere. No, she was someone who, who attended state events. So she was a prominent person, but she never thought about it. I think that's, that's the, the other part of it. My own interpretation of Johnson Bono Furiata's lack of uh, recognition for the Kwashioko, she never thought about publishing. She was just doing. She was just doing. And so th those are, I think that those are some of the, the, the terms that it, it, it is a complex story, as historians like to say, it's a complex story. <laughs> Just, just, just a quick one. Did, did the days of flight, flight lieutenant Rawlings, did the, the, the period of Rawlings, did it have any change on the prominence and recognition of women or no? Yes. In fact, Thank you. I have, I, I run away from doing women's history and I've come back full circle. And I say, it is, one of it is that the flight left in Rollins era can be seen as the lowest of the low for women. Women were beaten. They were gunpowder was it, many atrocities were committed against women. In fact, I can never, I still can't bring myself to write about that. But then comes the Beijing conference of the 1990s, 93, I think. And the wife of Rollins takes up what a couple of lawyer women had been talking about, about rights of women and all that. And she takes it up to a high level, making sure that Ghana would recognize women and make interventions, very, very significant interventions that changed the destiny of women in Ghana. In fact, th that's, that's also even when you think to that, uh, that, first, that first lady, it, it is the, the, the classic complex thing historians say, not all bad, not all good. You just have to report everything as it happened and hope chronology helps to shape things up. But, they, they, so Rollins's era, very, very significant in legally laws that were passed to help women in, in all areas. They founded the Women and Juvenile Units. We called it Waju to do this. It's the, the police, they, they, they changed the police, they changed the laws, they not changed, but impacted for the best, better of women. They, they worked to have nursery schools, daycares created so that a struggling women could send their children to these daycares, quote unquote, for free or for, for little, so that they could work. So that's, that's, that's the conundrum. Um, we have a question from Ikram. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. My internet, hi, thank you, Mary, and thank you, Shireen. My internet is a bit unstable, so if I freeze or something, I <laughs> uh, just want to let you know that. But I, I wanted to thank you so much for the presentation, but also the way you told the story. It, it just spoke to me in, in so many ways. I was recently talking to a group of women in the Greater Horn of Africa who were working on a certain project about CEDAW, mm -hmm. and they are trying to advocate for CEDAW and related um, international convention or other policies. And the fact that you, that now I learned that Annie Jaga, I think is the last name, is actually, was a founder or co-founder of the policy that gave birth to the CEDAW convention is a great new knowledge for me that mm -hmm. I will actually share in my next. So I'm thinking, knowing the works of these women are not only, I think, relevant in Ghana, but across, uh, the continent. So my question was to you, Mary, are women in Ghana who are doing, who are trying to advance uh, women's rights, 
do they build on the work on these women? Are they known in those circles? Um, just wanted to know what would that look like? What that looks like in Ghana particularly? So. The simple answer is no. <laughs> in fact, we have some media wars going on between the older women and the younger women sort of. So a movement started in Ghana called Pepe Dem. Pepe, um, Cayenne Pepe. Pepe DEM, Pepe Dem movement. And the Pepe Dem movement called themselves as feminists of you know, the current order. And they are the ones who have come in. They're going to do all the work to eliminate discrimination against women. And then there was a pushback from these other older women uh, who had been in the game for a while. So the National Council for Women's um, Women in Development was founded in 1975, for example. And there's, it put all asso women's associations together under one unit. And NCWD itself had also been advocating. So th there was a pushback from NCWD and all of these older women's associations that had worked so hard to get Waju formed, to get all of these things done. The laws changed for inheritance for women. And, and they felt, wait, we are alive. Why are you eliminating us? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean it it's you know it, when you say that it makes me realize that your project's actually going to be quite a lot bigger because what you've done in this phase is to map where the elite women were I mean I, I just I think that also bears noting that these were women who were already part of powerful families as Dominic pointed out um, and so they're well positioned in, in some ways. Um, it would be really interesting to see uh, what the contributions of uh, women leaders at the grassroots level uh, was, at least from the work that I did uh, on South Africa, you can see how much they uh, crafted ideas of nation and freedom and, you know, what is the future uh, going to require for all of us to be free? And that wasn't just an elite project. In fact, you might say women in collective movements at the bottom actually also shaped uh, those ideas. So that that's sort of another layer. Mm -hmm. And then the layer of generational challenges and how feminism and ideas about women's place also shift across the 20th century, but would be yet another element. I mean, I'm 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 suggesting this is this is a really exciting large project as you pursue the intellectual history uh, further. I, are there other questions? I'm you know, I was I was uh, curious uh, about that because, as you say, that that's how the precursors. Mm -hmm. to these big documents also get uh, uh, erased from the record. Um, and it seems to me like she, perhaps more than some of the other figures that you have named, fits much more squarely into a feminist history, uh, yeah. feminist contributions from Ghana. I have to say this. In fact, when she became a judge, she declared that she could not be called. Um, it, 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 some, some of the lawyers would come and they wouldn't know what to say. They say, your ladyship. And said, no, your honor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dominique, go ahead. Um, you know, Sharon, you were saying, you know, less elite women. And Mary mentioned uh, school teachers and nurses. And in the world of school teachers, there are men and women. And in the world of nurses, it's more uh, complicated, but how is it that there are men and women who are school teachers, but then when, and, and this, this is a place for the making of intellectuals, right? Or it's a kind of seedbed of intellectuals. Why is it that men make it and women don't make it? They come from the same activity. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's that that's comes to what Theodosio told me that and and then I also met Leticia Obeng too that 
for women, I think women make these contributions and it never at some point thought about, I have to be recognized for this thing that I have done. You know, in ways in which the men, it, they, they did these things and wanted to write their names right up there. That's at least the women I am looking at. That's what I see that they, not that they were happy to be in the background, but they actually wanted, they, they wanted to actually do the work as opposed to get recognized for the work. I mean, the, the, that is that, um, is that something that, and I don't know if these, this group of women that you have mapped out in these different spaces, have they written their autobiographies or their memoirs? It's be very interesting to know how they saw them, their own projects, you know, what they saw themselves doing. Um, whether it's their own not claiming recognition or whether it's the society kind of just skimming over women when it uh, recognizes people. Liti Shobin does write her autobiography. And um, when I met with her, she gave it to me. So she, she writes and in it, so she in, 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 the, in her account, she doesn't write it as, it's not a political piece. She writes it as, this is my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she, she came to, she returned to Ghana and was in, was in the university, Kwame Kwame University of Science and Technology with her husband. And her husband died in 59. And I think with that, 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 that death and the way she dealt with it was to, to, do, to do things. In fact, she moved and went, went to a crime, it changed her life, but her writing, and when you speak to her, is, is, is around this period of grief. Yeah. You know, I think that, that kind of, what I, when I met with her and I went to her home, the times I went to her home, that was, we always came back to this period of grief for her. So that's, I think that's what shows in her writing. The Anijiage, wrote and was very very vocal she was all of all of them she was the vocal one and she always she said we will do this we, we will be by the men but we will do this as women that, that's that's to paraphrase her that that was her thing that we'll do this but we'll do it as, as women by the men we are not going to do it as men we will do it as women so I think there's a thing there amongst all of them. Yeah. They are womanness. <laughs> but also that she is building internationalism rather than the nation, right? Is is an interesting counterpoint. Deborah. Yeah, so I just wanted to quickly mention since the conversation was going about women in Ghana who were barely schooled, who also maybe helped to the nationalist agenda and I recently read the autobiography of Kwame Nkrumah and he mentioned, so this lady was called Amagana and this was because of her fierce nationalism. And I was very happy that Nkrumah mentioned her in the autobiography because when he was arrested by the colonial powers, she slashed herself with a machete in protest. And so that was written in the book. And I was like, I did not know that these women were that radical to do something like that. Um, and another woman who I have had at least recognized in some form. So the 50 Peswa coin in Ghana, there's a picture of a market woman. And I know she's called, I think, Rebecca Aite. And she was also kind of spoken about in the history books because she used a lot of her resources and her grassroots um, agenda to help. To, to First, she also helped with some of the boycotts of um, European goods when there was a boycott in 1944. And she also helped the Kwame Nkrumah um, agenda to go for um, independence. So at least... In some way, I believe we tr we are trying, but there is so much work to do because it's not there. You have to, you have to maybe read or ask. But it, like it ties into 
uh, Mary's narrative that it's very easy to hear about men's achievements, but even for elite women who are working, it's, it's somehow we still have to work on it. But I just wanted to chip in about these two women, the Amagana who slashed herself with the machete and Rebecca Aite who led the grassroots movement for uh, rallying women and children to support Nkrumah during independence. So thank you. <laughs> Interesting. Mary, do you want to comment on that? Otherwise, I think Tag still wants to make a further comment. No, the, the Am Amagana story is, is, is a very interesting one. It still doesn't leave, uh, it, it still uh, pushes the fact that there were so many women. In fact, the CPP was founded on women's money. Nkrumah himself was poor. He had no money. It was the market women mm -hmm. who paid for everything. Because Nkrumah came to Ghana as a worker for the UGCC. He had a monthly salary. The UGCC found, um, funded his travels. So when he was dismissed from that position, it was the women who stepped in to, to pay for everything. And then the songs, Nkrumah, CPP was iconic because of the songs they made. And it was the women who made these songs. Also because of the women, they are fashion, they are fashion, they wore the CPP colors, they in all over the marketplaces. So that vision, mm. in, in, in absence of the TV that we have now, they made that visionary impact. And, and, and these women were also the ones who would run to the road. So everything about why in Chroma CPP won, you can never write that story without the woman. And that is why Nkrumah's story is not a full story because he does mention Amagana, but leaves out some of it. And you know, it's interesting. One of the women, there's a prominent Ghanaian Nkrumah is called Kwesi Pratt. His mom did something like FBI work. When Nkrumah was leaving house arrest, the woman, she was a cleaner, cook. So she would come in, he would write messages, she would take it out. Never mentioned. And in fact, when I met her son, I said, oh, I, I've heard about your mom. She said, oh, my mom was not important in the story. Read to that effect. You know, what my mom did was very little. Let's focus on the big things that big people did. Right. <laughs> I found that interesting, yeah. We do love our big man stories in Africa, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Tag, last question, and then I think- Sure, we might sure. Let, let, me, let me take you into what I call a trajectory. Let us look uh, for the future. Okay. Do you see a Margaret Sarcher in, uh, in Ghana? Can you see uh, women taking such prominent positions? And as you know, now in Sweden, we have a woman prime minister. In New Zealand, we have a woman prime minister. But in our own continent, in Africa, many of them, I have Liberia, I think it starts with Liberia, uh, Namibia, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Central African Republic, Malawi, all those countries, they had women either head of state or prime ministers. And in some of those countries, the general awareness, the collective awareness and knowledge and political maturity in those countries was probably less than what is in Ghana. Do you see women in the future looking down the road, taking such high profile positions? Thank you, ma'am. Yes, I do. But we, we have a little journey to go before we actually get there. I think that in the next 10 years, Maybe, maybe in the next, after we do the next two elections, Ghana will be ready for a, a female president. We, we are kind of like the USA. Women, women, women are, are, are allowed to be there, but when, when a woman smiles too much, she smiles too much. When she makes, you know, all the things Hillary went through, yeah, not to say she was perfect, but a lot of the things she went through is because just not ready for a woman. So Mary, I said that was the last one, but we have one last question, if you don't mind. Can you take one more? So Elizabeth would like to ask a question. Yeah, thank you very much, Mary, for your presentation. 
I'm working um, on Ghanaian women in poetry. I want to know if you know uh, about Elizabeth Pio Garbra. I want to, I try to understand how uh, women um, participate in the political debate and um, express, express their intellectual voice in poetry as a space of, um, uh, uh, as an intellectual space. Hmm. I, I think I think that you you've you've taken me on this this journey this other line of not just women in poetry but also these our very prominent uh, our ideas of the Chinua Achebes in Ghana so it's this other land and and uh, Amataidu that women women's expression so pure Gabra yes women's expressions politically. Hmm. I think we should see it within the context of what will happen to you if you speak in Ghana over the years. So at many points in time, you could be, you would be arrested and until recently, you know, and dehumanized as a woman. And, and, and we, we, we really have to think through that in perspective before we look at why women have stayed away. So when we think through the, the early years, then chroma years, women, women were also arrested. You know, chroma came into power because of positive action. But in the in the 60s, they would arrest these same market women in Takradi who would go on the streets to complain about the compulsory savings that the national budget was put into the national budget. Everybody must save money. And the women went on the streets and they were arrested. Following that, throughout the Ghana's history, women, but when women are arrested, the soldiers, they dehumanize them. And so that, that, that is the context for me when you think of why women would not want to come into, because, I mean, you can be shot. Some men were shot dead. <laughs> they were shot dead. And then all that, but is the dehumanizing part of it, which sometimes uh, women and their families feel as if they do not want this image to, to be out there. And I think after we got 1992, when we went into um, this democratic era, Fourth Republic, things are changing in Ghana. The women are becoming less afraid of the consequences of their political statements. So it, it is that part to the, what happens to you when you speak. Recently, there's a video, uh, there's a documentary series that University of Birmingham, the National Film and uh, NAFTI, National Film and Television Institute, have come up with uh, scholars from there. It is called When Women Speak. Um, the, the director, the editor director is a lady called Asei Tamaklu, I'll, I'll type it in there. When Women Speak with Kate Skinner and other, other folks. It, it, it's an interesting um, documentary. They speak to all of these women who are alive now. And some of them, it, it, so Nana Kunedo Admiral Rollins is, for example, in this, in this documentary, and you have other women who are like, Nana Kredo Ajeman Rawlings, look at what they did to us <laughs> under their era. And, and at points in time, they had time to meet. And some of the scholars who were on it had been had experienced the power of the nation, the power of the state when it decides to come for you, you know. And so it, 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 there were tense moments which you they capture in this documentary. It's very, very fascinating. Very, very, if you know the people who are interviewing and being interviewed, then you understand the tensions that go on there. I think that that would be helpful to you. Thank you, Mary, for a very, very rich discussion. I think we should stop now because people often have to move to a 2.30 uh, engagement class or seminar. But I think that was a fabulously rich and you know engaging and thought-provoking presentation. And I, I wish you well on the start of this huge project. I, I think we are pushing your boundaries a little bit. Uh, 
and um, you know so that's the fun thing about talking to people about it a lot more gets added right and it's easy for us to add themes but good luck with uh, with how you pull it all together <laughs> so thank you very much thank you thank you thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon <laughs>